Now I'm on. Ooh. Okay. Um, we're going to start here in just a minute. For those of us joining online, this is the first sessions of the day. So people are waking up and uh, filing in. So we're going to give it just a minute. Join us. I did. Are you seeing the I have seen. Thank you so much. We've all left off. Ditched. She came with the first person and then has hugs. I'm just like, hi. I know you're about to leave, but don't leave with us. I was actually going elsewhere. But you know the way you spoke to us yesterday? I'm Moira. Oh, sorry, sorry. I'm Catherine. Very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. I think they were all calling. No, we were, in fact, not we were all colleagues. Yeah, we were all colleagues, yeah? Of the Web Foundation. She's saying we were all colleagues. And yes, we were. We were all. Yeah, I until Wednesday. We are still all kind of. Until October. We are still colleagues. We are, yeah. So I'll sit and watch my colleagues. Thank you so much. Good to see you. But it's good to see you. I'll even sit here to make. Okay, there you go. Okay. So she had to get her to the Scoot up. Us. of the day and we're in a big room um, so we expect people to be joining us uh, but um, yeah we're we're gonna start here in about a minute
think we're streaming, and I think we have a, a group here, so I uh, will get us started. Uh, my name is Moira Whalen. I am the Director of Democracy and Technology at the National Democratic Institute, and I'd like to welcome you to our panel, uh, which is sponsored by Policy, which we are thrilled to, to uh, be here and be partnering with, with them on, um, enabling a safe internet for women and girls. And before I introduce our panel and our discussion, um, I have to tell you, this conversation was conceived of months ago in Brussels when a group of us were at another internet conference and we really found a gap. We really didn't hear this conversation happening and it bothered us. So we stood around, we came up with the idea to have a conversation about gender and women and girls and, and digital uh, safety. And we've been heartened, I think, to come to IGF and see that here on the last day, after kicking off first with uh, Kat's session uh, in the Web Foundation, um, we've had a full week of conversation about this issue and the best practices forum that we will all be going to later in the day. It's very promising that we are actually going to realize some real progress and real successes on this issue. Um, the amount of energy and, and uh, thought and research coming from civil society has been tremendous. And I think we can all take that with us. So I wanted to kind of kick us off with, with that understanding today because um, you know what we really want to talk about are next steps. What do we do? What, what is the progress? What is it going to take to make an online environment safe for women and girls? And joining us today, I have a panel of incredibly impressive women. Uh, the Honorable Nima Lugangara, who is a member of parliament in Tanzania. We also are joined by uh, Anika Makwakwa, who is with the Global Digital Inclusion Partnership. Irene Mwendwa. Did I do it, Irene? Yes, you did. We've been practicing. Um, and Kat Townsend, who, oh, I'm sorry, Irene is with Policy, um, and Kat Townsend, who is with the Web Foundation. And we're going to kick off our conversation today, just so people can follow along. We first want to hear from the Honorable Lugangira, who is going to outline for us her perspective on being a woman in politics and both the extra challenges that that poses for her digital experience, as well as the opportunities that she is empowered with being a member of parliament and the steps we can take to address this issue. Um, we'll do that and then we'll move to our panelists who will also give interventions and then we'll move to a discussion. Um, before I do that, I, I did want to use the floor to give a bit of attention to what brought NDI to this conversation. Um, summarizing our event today will be my colleague Sandra Pepra, who's joining us remotely. Um, and she leads our gender team. And between the technology and the gender team, we really experienced and we're seeing globally that this was becoming a challenge. A lot of NDI's typical work is training women who are candidates, who are running for office. And no matter where we looked, the online abuse was the number one deterrent to women deciding to participate in, the pub in public life. And for us, that is a fundamental threat to democracy. So we've done a lot of work to identify hate speech, to do lexicon research, to take steps to make women safe online. Um, but what we wanted to do is we went back to those women globally and convened eight focus groups around the world with 100 political women. We came up with a list of interventions. We tested those interventions with tech experts, with governance experts, and we came up with a list of about 24. And they're here. You can find them online at ndi.org. Um, and we really view this as the menu of options because each political situation is different. But we also look at it as this isn't just a tech problem, this is a political parties problem, this is a parliamentary problem, um, that there are, there are many ways that we can, we can work together to address it. 
Um, and civil society, obviously, although I have to say the civil society interventions, uh, civil society is doing every one of the things um, that can be done and are, are really ahead of the curve. Um, so, so now our next step is, is Irene joined us on a trip where we went around, we talked to stakeholders like UN Women, we talked to uh, tech companies, and, and we presented these ideas and asked for their help and their partnership in addressing these challenges. Now we're here. We will also, many of the same actors will be guiding us through to uh, CSW in March, was the UN Committee on the Status of Women, which will look at technology as a major issue. So, and we're also supporting uh, the Global Partnership to End Online Violence Against Women in Politics, which is uh, a US-led initiative, but with nine uh, global governments at this point, an advisory group to begin addressing this issue from a political standpoint. Um, so we really are feeling like the stars are aligning and that there is opportunity for change. Like I said, for NDI, this means that this is, this is a, a game changer for democracy and that we can have more women involved in politics because we all win when 50% of the global community feel empowered to fully participate in their own political life. Um, so with that, I want to turn it over to the Honorable Lugangira to start us off just with your perspective on your experience as well as where you see the opportunities. Um, thank you very much. Um, first of all, good morning, everyone. Um, as introduced, I'm Nima Lugangira, member of parliament in Tanzania, but also African Pal chairperson of the African Parliamentary Network on Internet Governance. Uh, we have about 30 plus members from 24 plus African countries. And I'd like to recognize in the room my co colleague, Honorable Susan Dossi from Malawi. Um, so where do I start? First of all, I have been active online prior to being a parliamentarian. So um, November was two years since, I'm a pal uh, since I became a parliamentarian in November 2020. And the first experience is the like totally opposite sides of how one is treated online when you're a leader versus -vis when you're not. So I used to be active online, posts, um, post about my work, doing policy advocacy, etc. Almost zero abuse. Suddenly, I'm a member of parliament. I post the same things I used to post. Enormously incredible amount of abuse. So to, to me, that was the first like shock. Like, whoa, OK. So it's, it's as if, um, I guess for women, the more public you are, it's kind of a norm that then you become a target, an easy target. That, that's number one. But then the other issue is that there is this notion that because you're in politics, you should not raise it. So the moment I started addressing it online, saying that this is abuse, then you get more abuse for raising it. It intensifies. Um, and and I remember there was one time I raised it in parliament. This was sometime last year, um, asking our minister of ICT to look into, into this issue, particularly for women in politics. Because I, I, I aspire to have so many of my female colleagues to be online, but they don't want to be online. And when, when I would ask them why, it's all because of their abuse. And the day that I said that in parliament, I think I got for like a whole week the most abuse I've ever got saying, ah, you women are crying, you want favors, you want this. And I'm like, it's not that. Now, the biggest challenge that a lot of people don't talk about is this issue of freedom of expression. So the abuse that is being thrown at us is being pegged around this notion that it's people expressing their freedom of expression. And when I call it out as a politician, as a legislator, then I'm told, 
as a legislator, you want to limit people's freedom of expression. And when a female politician is being attacked and abused online, not even the women human rights activists come to their defense. No one comes to their defense, and this is a fact. No one. So it's as if society has accepted that women in politics should be abused. It comes with the job title. They tell us that when you decided to get into politics, you knew what you signed up for. Or they tell us that you politicians just like to be praised, you don't like to be critiqued. Then I ask myself, what is criticism? Criticism is if I raise an issue and you don't accept the issue, let's have an argument or a debate on the issue, on the agenda. But when you shift from the agenda to my gender, that no longer is criticism. That is no longer freedom of expression. That is plain right abuse. So I personally have an issue when we're pushing for freedom of expression, we forget the other side of the coin. That you shouldn't use your freedom of expression to make me not use my own freedom of expression. Because as a result of what's happening now, women leaders are choosing to self-censor. How are we self-censoring? We're deciding not to be online. Then when we're not online, what does that do to our visibility? The public in which we're leading then assumes women leaders are not doing anything because we're not visible. The cheapest and easiest way for us to gain that visibility is by being online. But if I'm not able to be online because of the abuse, what happens to my visibility? So this goes against even the efforts of the likes of NDI, trying to get more women into leadership, more women into politics. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen because the online space is not friendly for us. If I'm a member of parliament, supposedly, with the power that I have and the access that I have, but I get abused online to the level of being belittled to almost being nothing, and there is nothing I can do about it, what do you think that young girl who is aspiring to become a politician, that young woman who is aspiring to become a politician, will they want to become a politician? And unfortunately, the easiest target is to sexualize us. Make us seem as if we're there because we slept with this one, that one, and the other. Make us seem that we're there because we did A, B, C, D. And when it's written online with all the graphicness, the people in my community who voted for me, they're going to believe it. How, am I going to be able to go around defending myself to everybody? Chances are no. So you find even the re-election of women leaders gets impacted. Because in our African community, the worst thing you can do for a woman is peg them sleeping around. I have a personal experience. One time, um, there's a picture I took with an older man, and he's very well known in politics, very influential, outside our parliament. And you can see, this is the parliament, and this is the parliament door. And I made a contribution in, in, in a few weeks later, I made a contribution in parliament calling for um, our government to look at the issue of nutrition for youngsters, because of the way they're eating, there's a lot of infertility, et cetera, et cetera. So what did people do? They went to look for that photo, and it was a whole week of abuse that this is what women MPs are doing in Dodoma, that's where our parliament is, busy going around with men, older men. It, went, it was like nonstop, to the point that I remember when I got home, my son asked me, mom, can you quit being an MP? Is, is, like, is it possible to quit? And I didn't understand why was he asking. Then I asked him, why are you asking? Like, where's that coming from? And then he told me, because pe my people in school have been sending me this. People are saying this about you. Maybe you can just resign. Like, so you can imagine the impact it goes to the point of the kids, to the point of the family. But unfortunately, nobody talks about it. Even when I talk about online abuse on women, it ends with journalists. 
So what, what you asked, what am I trying to do? So what I'm trying to do is to make a lot of noise to elevate that online abuse on women in politics needs attention because it's detrimental to the democratic space and the participation of women. And um, I, I met with the UN Tech Envoy yesterday and I expressed that UN Women is not carrying this issue of online abuse on women in politics as it should. We're talking about GBVs, gender-based violence. I need to see online abuse being clearly stated as one of the GBVs, which at the moment it isn't. And I think until we can recognize online abuse as a gender-based violence, it will elevate even us when we raise it. Because at the moment we're raising it, but it's like, you people are just crying for favors and whatnot. So to sum up, I'm very pleased that we're having this platform, but the impact of online abuse on women in politics, even what I'm sharing here is just the tip of the iceberg. We have 143 women parliamentarians in Tanzania, less than 10% are online. In the African parliamentary network that we have right now, we can ask my colleague there if she's online. They don't want to be online because of the abuse. Then what does it do? And, and we're all trying to preach gender inclusion. How are you going to get gender inclusion if your female legislators are not online? Because you need your female legislators to be on the same side with you to achieve that gender inclusion, that digital gender inclusion. But if we are not able to be online, then who are, who are you advocating for? I end there. Thank you. I think we can all end there. No, um, <laughs> it's incredibly powerful. And thank you very much for sharing that experience. In making a lot of noise, it's also a very personal experience. So we appreciate your your courage in in being in the legislature and also telling your story. Um, I want to start then with Irene and come to you. And you know, policy brought us here together today. Um, so when we see experiences like the Honorable is, uh, that she is having, how do a group of feminist uh, techies um, help and contribute to making the online environment safer for women and girls? Thank you very much, um, Honorable Nima, for being candid with us and for being candid with all the online uh, users here today because I believe most of you have online, um, you have accounts online and you see this happening. Um, and just to start us off, um, Moira is feminist techies take these issues very, very seriously and we try and provide solutions together with others in very many different ways. Um, at policy, the one thing we do and which is part and parcel of our approach is research. To be able to better inform our governments, to be able to inform the platforms themselves to act fast, they need the evidence. So um, against the 2021 general election in Uganda, we're able to conduct a research on how women politicians, specifically candidates, how they were using social media because Unfortunately, due to COVID, they were asked to really find other ways of um, conducting campaigns, which is not physical campaigning, and therefore it required and made most of them to go and engage online and virtually. So they held Zoom, you know, they, held, they, they used Zoom, they used WhatsApp communities, uh, WhatsApp groups, they used Facebook groups, they used you know, Twitter spaces, they used so many avenues to engage with their communities. And what happened is that um, we conducted a study and we found that whenever women leaders were abused online, of course they felt discouraged one time, second time they felt further discouraged, and up to the third, fourth time, they left the platform altogether. What does this mean to your uh, male opponent? He will continue to engage and thrive and um, uh, include the community to vote for them. And this affected how women politicians in Uganda were campaigning against their male counterparts. We were able to conduct that research. I've shared it on the Zoom link, but we're able, I'm able to share with everyone. It's called Amplified Abuse. 
Um, and from that, we were also able to engage directly with some of the women officials, about 20 of them, to ask them, are these findings true? And what would you want feminist techies, as Moira is saying, um, and organizations like ourselves in Uganda and others, what would you like for you, for, for you to engage better online against the next election? Because you still need to use and employ these digital platforms. And they told us, we know, to, we know how to use some of these platforms, but there are some, there remains challenges. But also we hear that um, there, are, there are ways that we can improve our engagement online. What are some of these ways to better improve ourselves? And we were able to co-create a program dubbed Vote Women Program, where we upskill elected women officials from the local government level to national levels to understand these digital platforms first because if they understand these digital platforms, they'll be able to use them better, they'll be more confident, they'll be able to engage their communities to even come on board and use them better, and they'll be able to share with fellow uh, women politicians to use these digital platforms. This far we have been able to train about 40 to, 40, 40 to 50 uh, elected women officials in Uganda and Tanzania alumni seated next to me, uh, together with about five um, other women MPs and about 40 local government level um, women leaders. They've been able to share and build a community and share and say, yes, they're abusing us, but we can use some of the tools online to report. We can use the tools online to get ahead because we still need to use these platforms. The other thing we are going into in the next phase is to see um, because you'll be doing your campaign trails as a woman leader, because you'll be engaged in so many things in your day-to-day -day activities, are you able to hire social media managers or are you able to use tools that are available online to better communicate? Because there are tools, you can schedule messages. You know this, isn't it? So we continue to engage them to use um, already available technologies to advance themselves online, to continue to engage online, and this way they build their digital resilience as opposed to leaving the platforms altogether. And then we also encourage them to build peer-to-peer -peer communities as Honorable Nima is saying, they need to talk to one another, they need to continue encouraging one another so that they can be able to get ahead some of these challenges they face online. The third approach we use is we talk to the platforms themselves. Trust and safety teams at Twitter, the trust and safety teams and the public uh, policy, um, public policy uh, teams at Meta, um, Google, and we ask them, how can you help elected women officials? And one of the ways that um, we've been directly engaged is that executive director and policy sits on the global safety advisor advisory for uh, the Meta, and we are able to give direct input that are very localized to the African context. And also we're able to, t to have that direct contact and tell them this is what's happening. Because what happens is Honorable Nima can come to us and tell us, what are you doing about this policy? How can I navigate this? Other influential women leaders who are not necessarily elected officials also approach us and tell us, how can we address some of these challenges we're experiencing from Senegal, from different countries in Africa? And we're able to really speak directly to these um, platforms, put the reports together, put all the evidence together in a very organized manner so that they can be able to address. Because at the end of the day, uh, we know that there are people who sit in these platforms who are responsible in um, to work with civil societies and to work with um, influential women leaders. So I'd encourage um, everyone in this room, l do not let the back stop with the work that you do. Try and build relationships and partnerships with these platforms themselves try and build relationships with governments to better improve your data protection acts or legislation or frameworks that can enable women leaders, um, both elected and just influential women, use this um, legislation to seek redress even in our courts of law. You know, she said she engaged the Ministry of I ICT directly to be able to better improve um, services and um, engagement for elected women officials. So I see that as a, as a very big opportunity for people in this room uh, to really form those um, partnerships with governments to continue to build better, um, better policies and to create room for women 
leaders to engage and share how we can improve um, the platforms all together. Thank you, Moira. Thank you very much. And I'm gonna switch it up slightly and first go to Annika, um, because I think we've, we've heard the point about even getting women to become politicians, right? There's a lot of, uh, of activity that happens even before then, where, where girls, their, their participation, they're making, they're self-censoring their participation. And I'd love for you to talk about that. And then Kat, after that, we'll go straight into you maybe to talk about the Web Foundation's work and also the kind of global connectivity and the global partnerships uh, that, that you're fostering. There we go. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that. Um, wow. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm usually talking about inclusion from an access point of view. But uh, part of why we developed uh, the meaningful connectivity framework was so that we can understand also what's impacting that uh, slow access for women and girls, but also what happens beyond access, because it's not good enough that we just want people to have access, but they, it's important to also understand that they need to remain safe uh, in, that, uh, in those moments of, of uh, them being able to access the internet. The example that uh, Honorable Nima gave about her son asking her to quit is actually an excellent one that I'm gonna pin my comments on. And that is a realization that online abuse of women actually has an impact of, on those women, but it, actually, it also has an impact on the next generation. And that is the girls who are observing this kind of abuse and learning at an early age that this is not a safe space uh, to be in or a desirable place to participate in, which then means that we, we stand a chance of eroding a lot of the benefits and gains we've made on advancing women in a lot of sectors if we now have a platform uh, and a space where women and girls are seeing examples that being successful, uh, being a leader, is not a good thing. So uh, there's a lot of work here for very many sectors, but I'm gonna focus mainly on government uh, because that's kind of what, uh, you know, in some of the work that we've been doing around policy, uh, we've been looking at. There is um, the same way that we have criminalized cat calling women in the streets, touching them inappropriately. We need to understand that the same kind of behavior is exactly what the women are experiencing online. And uh, so there's a need for an updating of legislative frameworks and uh, our criminal laws to actually include uh, this kind of behavior and criminalize it as it should be. It is nothing more than just sexism and based on misogyny and a very toxic uh, way in which we've allowed males in particular uh, to uh, interact in society. So in, in a space like this, we've accepted that this kind of behavior is unacceptable and we, governments need to also take the lead in making sure that that same behavior that uh, is expected of us here also uh, permeates to the online spaces. But it doesn't just end there, because for example, South Africa has one of the latest, and you know, I've heard a lot of people say really uh, wonderful things about our cyber crimes law. But I will tell you that while we have the latest cyber crimes law that is so progressive, including criminalizing uh, revenge pornography and those kinds of issues, we also have a law enforcement um, uh, professionals who don't understand the bill and don't know how to enforce it. So there is a huge amount of uh, public education that we need to embark on. The same way when we decided that every car driver had to wear a seat belt because it was safe for them. There was a role for government, there was a role for car manufacturers, and there was a role for society, and there was public education all across. And that's exactly what we need now. Uh, that we've, we, we don't need to argue about whether this is acceptable or not. Uh, it is basically just a microcosm of our society. We, we've accepted that it's not acceptable to treat women like this in public spaces. This is another public space. And so we need to make fitting laws 
and educate everyone about their role to make sure that we are enforcing this. And this is important, why? Because first of all, just from a basic human right point of view, women have a right to safety. They have a constitutional right to safety like everyone else and in all the spaces. But secondly, and this is argument I really don't like, but sadly, it's the one that governments tend to listen to the most. There is a financial cost to the exclusion of women in digital development. Governments are losing close to a trillion US dollars in women not participating in the digital economy because they are not going to just select not to participate on one particular platform alone. We know that even in platforms such as Instagram where women try to sell their wares, their accounts are also violated through hijacking uh, and people posting things that are undesirable and off-brand to them. It's another form of violence. So we've done a lot of work, I think, in understanding how online violence manifests itself, the different ways in which it manifests itself. And we need to continue to add to that because this hijacking of accounts, for example, is a new way that um, you know, these uh, folks are using to silence women online. However, understanding that is, is, is good, developing policies, we have to implement. You know, we have to implement, we have to criminalize this kind of behavior. We have to also criminalize the people who enable the behavior. And I'll give you an example. We had a woman politician in South Africa about three weeks ago who had um, a, a, a gentleman, well, I don't know if I can call him a gentleman by his behavior. Anyway, we, we had a man who was um, extorting her and um, released a, a sex tape of her uh, onto Twitter which is a criminal offense, uh, punishable by up to three years in prison. She shouldn't even have to open a case. The police should know exactly what to do in order to deal with that situation and add extortion charges. But also it's the people who are resharing the video in a jurisdiction where they know very well that this is criminal, that we need to actually communicate zero tolerance for this kind of behavior. Uh, you know, there's a, a role obviously for platforms, but there's a role also for us as citizens, how we participate and enable and observe uh, this kind of behavior, uh, that we must absolutely have a responsibility. Uh, the same way that uh, uh, seatbelt campaigns focused on children. So when you get in your car, your kids tell you, mommy, put on your seatbelt. We need that same kind of approach, where it's an, a whole of society approach from, law and from government officials to citizens to also a, a unique role for private sector, which I'm sure Kat will uh, touch on. So I will leave it at this point and uh, pass it on to uh, Kat. Thank you so much, Anika. Um, thank you, Honorable Nima. Thank you, Irene. And thank you, Moira, for bringing us, well, Irene, for bringing us in and Moira for, for leading this discussion. Um, and thank you all for joining today. Uh, it's just an honor to be here um, on this panel. Uh, so my name's Kat Townsend. I'm um, currently leading a policy team at the uh, World Wide Web Foundation. Uh, so I can speak a bit about the partnerships that we've gotten involved in. Um, but I just want to take a step back of why and what the purpose is from the perspective of the Web Foundation. So in this room, it may seem obvious that we have to work for gender equity in all public spaces. Those public spaces include online. Um, I think the philosophy of the Web Foundation is that the Web is supposed to be an open, safe, trusted, and empowering space for everyone, uh, a place where anybody around the world can come, collaborate, share their creativity, and share their ideas. Uh, and when you have over 50% of the world getting um, attacked and harassed online, then it doesn't live up to that vision. It's not a place where people feel free to convene. Um, and uh, we don't have a ton of data about how uh, prevalent the problem is and how severe it is. Uh, one study from 2019 run by Google's Jigsaw team uh, in collaboration with The Economist said that 80% of the respondents who identified as women said that either they'd personally experienced or they'd witnessed harassment online. So this speaks to this enabling environment that Onika was mentioning, um, the presence, the demonstration that Honorable Nemo was mentioning, that young, young girls and young boys, people of all shapes and sizes, look at the web and say, that's not a place that's safe. 
that's not a place where we can express ourselves, or that's a place that is providing comfort to those who would harm other people. Um, so that is the interest that we have, is how do you make it a, a better and open space? So we have been working with the tech companies, um, as, as others have too. With, uh, we ran a 120 organization, multi-stakeholder workshop series with the uh, companies and said, what can we do, how can we fix this? And we got Meta, Google, Twitter, and TikTok um, to say, okay, we're going to change our curation, we're gonna change our reporting, uh, and we'll give you transparency on what we did. And after a year, as we've been following up with them, they said, look at all these great changes that we've made. And they did make some changes to the curation and reporting. And uh, those of you who use those tools every day, you might see that you have a better ability to block, you have a better ability to report. But what they didn't do is show us any data. So it looks better, but we don't know if they've actually changed anything because they won't tell us how many people are being harassed, how often is it happening, and how severe is the harassment. And there is a, a quote from Maria Ressa, who I will listen to anything that she says um, and support it, and she said, uh, if you don't have facts, you can't have truth. If you don't have truth, you can't have trust. And if we don't have a trusted web, if we don't have a trusted internet, then people won't express themselves, they won't gather online, and that's really the world that we're trying to work for. So what do we do? Uh, so at the moment, we're working with um, a wide group of civil society organizations around the world and with the tech companies to map out what are the government policies, what data is available, and what products are there that are used to prevent and to respond to online harassment. So we're trying to get a better sense of what does work in this space, how can we give recommendations to governments and recommendations to tech companies to civil society on here are our good practices, here's how they work in different contexts. And I'll just say that you know one of the big gaps that we see is all of the data that's collected is on people who are survivors. Have you been attacked? What is your experience? It's on you to report it. There's no information about what we call, or what's currently called, predators. Nobody's asking, how often have you attacked someone online? What did you say to them? How did you, what did you do? And uh, so we're not really thinking about the enabling environment. Um, and that's something that we'd like to, to fix because you may not know uh, if, you are, if you are attacking. It may be that when you repost a video, you think, well, it's already out there, so I'm not causing harm by adding to it, but you are. Um, now, some people do know that they are predators, like those who attacked our session on Monday, Future of a Feminine Web. Um, we had a Zoom bombing with targeted harassing language, with violent videos, with pornogra pornographic videos. Even today it happened. So the IGF has apologized to us after a few um, engagements to ask them, um, but it's still happening. So these spaces are attacked, uh, and they reignite more traumas as that happens. Um, and so, going forward, what we are working on, again, to get these uh, good practices to be able to share out, and as uh, Moira said, we're looking with the UN. Commission on the Status of Women is happening in March. Their focus is on technology. How do we infuse the work that we're having here with UN women so that they take um, and are empowered with a greater leadership role? Um, Global uh, Digital Compact, the, um, the consultations for those will close out at the end of March. What is the gender presence in those consultations? How can we work with UN Tech Envoy to drive a process that is transparent and accountable um, and that comes out recommendation, with recommendations that we can follow on, that we can track? Um, and then there's also this summit for democracy. And what's, what I'll leave you with is just, this is not a gender issue. This is not siloed to uh, a portion of society. The tools that are used to attack women and to attack uh, minoritized genders are those that are used to disrupt um, misinformation, they're used to disrupt elections, um, and they're used to cause uh, greater chaos in society. And so the reason that we focus on this is because it really does affect us all. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, and thank you to all of our panelists. I'm looking at our time, and I want to make sure that we do have uh, time and space for, for a vibrant discussion. 
Um, so we do have some questions online, but uh, I, I think I, if it's okay with you all, I just want to open it up and see if we can collect maybe one or two questions from the room, and then uh, and then we'll go to online. Let's see. I think we're waiting for a microphone to find our way here. Let's say. And when you ask your question, go ahead and, and identify yourself and ask your question. That? We'll do here, and then we'll, okay. we'll go over here. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's very vibrating, you know, the insights sharing from everyone. My name is Rumki Farhana, and I'm representing Article 19 South Asia Regional Office based in Dhaka, Bangladesh. And all these aspects that has been coming out from you is very common. And we, are, we have been working addressing those issues wherever we are getting opportunities. Uh, one issue I want to mention is about um, enabling environment and inclusivity. Uh, for inclusivity, it's not only about like women, women. It's about, I would uh, rather say, intersectional gender approach if we could incorporate that will uh, that will give us a better picture wider picture where we are living in for example um, in Bangladesh uh, we have this penal code 377 uh, that enables like that takes away the citizen right from the um, sexually diversified people and they cannot uh, claim citizen right expressing their identity like I myself belong to I'm not a man I'm not a woman I belong to this category of sexual diverse uh, sexual identification so this is what she was saying like self-censorship we do self-censorship being um, human rights activist yes uh, we do uh, self-censorship when we uh, go for movement, whether it is silent movement or a very dominant movement, we, we go for self-censorship. So if, until or unless, uh, it came out from a uh, different panelist, until or unless we do address it, we cannot hear it. And if we cannot hear it, we cannot work on it. So uh, it's very important that if we can enable an environment is yes if we could create the environment where um, very uh, detail to detail problems comes out or the experiences comes out that might be another um, it's not opportunity that will give us um, the 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 weapon to work with to deal with to solve with and we are um, um, Madam um, Parliament member from Tanzania, what she said, like online abusement and people stay offline when they become um, someone very uh, vocal or active. It is. It doesn't. It doesn't uh, happen only for the politicians. It happens everywhere, even in the professional sector when the women starts working because the women need to um, give the. Pr pr and the uh, evidence that they are better than men, they are better than any man and many men. And it gives the vulnerab vulnerability when people attack on sexuality, when the women are growing up. So this thing actually, um, what uh, Anika was saying, that it, leaves, it, it, it does exist in the actual life, that impacts the virtual life actually. So I cannot finish it now, it's, it's not like within a minute to finish, there are lots of issues, but glad to share what I wanted to share. Thank you. Thank you, and I think we're gonna go back here first. No, no, yeah. We're gonna go here. Um, while you're getting ready, I will say there is a vibrant discussion, well, there is a discussion going on uh, in the online space, but it, it does get to, and, and one of our online participants will know about uh, uh, the gender gaps and exacerbating what exists. So that did come up online as well, but please. Hi everyone, um, my name is Naisa, I'm a researcher uh, on gender-based violence from Tunisia. Uh, actually, I just wanted to highlight an important point, which is, um, that needs to be clarified, I think, in uh, such discussions, that the issue is gender-based violence or abuse 
is not uh, polarized. It's not women against men. It's in general people who are for human rights, for women's rights, no matter what their gender, no matter if they're women or men, because sometimes women themselves tend to exert gender-based violence. Sometimes I see activists or women's or parliamentary sharing a post and then women posting on that, commenting on that post with um, gender uh, violence, gender-based violence comments saying that you should maybe take care better take better care of your kids or your family or your husband you should be you do this on or that so it's not uh, we should we it's not a polarized thing men against women it's more about like who is for human rights and women's rights i just wanted to um, share this point thank you so much for sharing your experiences it's really inspiring to see uh, such amazing women sharing their experiences and trying to fight for uh, justice. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to let our panel respond to those first, and then we'll come right back to, to these two questions in the room. Thank you. I know being mindful of time very quickly. Um, I just want to highlight that when I'm talking about women in politics, um, the online abuse on women in politics, I'm, I'm in no way I'm diluting the online abuse on other groups, but I'm speaking specifically on women in politics because we are not considered as a marginalized group. This is a fact and this is a fact. Unfortunately, when anybody's thinking about online abuse of women, no one would it, would it click that, oh, and women in politics are part of that because of the nature of our work and the nature of the power that we supposedly have. And it is for that reason I decided that I'm going to use the experience, my personal experience, to speak on behalf of all women parliamentarians and all women in politics. And through that, bring you guys along to also recognize that women in politics is also a critical group. Because a lot of the things that you're saying, to fix them, we need legislation. Who creates legislation? It's legislators. So you need your women in politics to be your allies. So that's number one. Number two. The other issue very quickly that I'm trying to champion in Tanzania is to also get the issue of online abuse to be recognized in political, in the, in, in, in political Parties Act and Election Act. Because during election, there are certain types of GBVs that have been accepted. You can report on them, but not online abuse. So that is the other thing that we're trying to do on the side of the legislation. And again, as you will speak for your own groups, I'm also speaking for my own group, Women in Politics. Thank you. Yeah, so let me quickly also just touch on that. I think it's really important for us to understand that part of why all of this is happening is that we still live in very patriarchal societies. And that has created the call for us to sit here and specifically talk about women and girls. Because if women and girls had equal opportunities, we wouldn't even be having these kinds of forums, right? So whether it's men who are abusing online or women who are abusing online, the, at the root of all of that is patriarchy. And we have to be committed to dis dismantling the patriarchy in order to understand that. So my standard question, my standard answer whenever people ask me, what about the boy child? I don't speak on it because he still has patriarchy, he'll be okay. Oh. Help me dismantle the patriarchy and then we can begin to talk about the boy child and how his masculinity can be different in an equal world. Thank you. Any other? I would also just add uh, one thing to that, um, which is there's structural and engineering aspects of things that we're trying to fundamentally change. So one of the things that NDI has prioritized this issue for is because if we can get the right AI, if we can get the right uh, uh, reporting structures in place for 50% of the global population, that's going to benefit all people, all parties, all marginalized groups, all intersectional identities and what we're still struggling with right we start with the 50 percent because even in the most marginalized communities there is a woman who is the most marginalized of the marginalized communities and uh so so we do take an approach that it is inclusive in in identifying our interventions it is intersectional um but you know this particular dynamic we focused on because it is both 
uh, the fundamental challenge as well as the opportunity for change. So I want to go here first, these two questions, um, and then, um, yeah, I want to leave a little bit of space for our online participants. Um, hello. Uh, firstly, thank you for your speech. I feel very empowered. Um, thanks to your speech. Uh, I come from Turkey's Internet Observatory, and we're actually feminist technologists that start off as women's rights digital data platform. And um, so my question is, uh, firstly to you, uh, that what does your party say, uh, and do you get support uh, from your allies in your own country, or your male party members, uh, when, when you face such abuse, and um, what do you think you can do to change um, and get support from that aspect? And secondly, for World Web Foundation, um, I also want to, on a, on a separate topic, um, the type of work that we do at Turkey's Internet Observatory is we use creative methods to extract data for exactly those issues. So, for example, just by looking at the Google search volume of the amount of Turkish women that Google, my husband loves me so much, he doesn't let me go to the doctor, we were able to generate the most granular and uh, the only data actually in Turkey that, told, uh, that um, exemplified that um, emotional violence happens in, in which cities, at which hours, and how people search for it, for example. So I'd love to get in touch with you about um, how we can use our big tech and engineering expertise for generating data where it is missing. And thank you um, again so much for, for the empowering speech and uh, talking in behalf of us. Thank you. We'll go right here. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Catherine Adair, um, the outgoing director of research at uh, the World Wide Web Foundation. But uh, I would like to also wear another hat, uh, having been the wife of a politician, and also with a family full of politicians. So what she's talking about, I know in reality. And I'll even just give an example. Even in the last elections, I actually had to help my auntie manage her Facebook and Twitter because the way she was trolled, she wanted to give up. And part of what came up was now a mess. So what I'm seeing here could be a discussion that we could even have for half a day. Uh, and actually understand and unpack some of the issues. And what I want to un unpack is even the experience we've had uh, in the Web Foundation. What Kat has not told you is the kind of data we have. Even from politicians, journalists, and all that. Mining that data, which is evidence-based, would amaze you. And the concern that I've found from the research is especially when we are being pushed to lump the research findings on women and girls under the generic gender. In the last two years, I've come to appreciate a lot of how a lot of things on women and girls then gets lost. Uh, but I'll just give two other things, again, evidence-based. And this, the painful thing which we've seen is when victims of hate speech, and I think somebody has commented on that, have to take action to report on the abusive comments and compel, it is them again to compel the perpetrators to take responsibility and rethink about posting the abusive remarks. In that, then we discuss with the tech companies. Then I'll just give one challenge they say they have, and that is language. They say language is a barrier in identifying hate speech and harassment in all linguistic diversity. And some of them say they don't have the capable AI tools to detect. My challenge, and that's why I say we could have this discussion even for half a day, if we could have space tourism, what is impossible? And that's why I agree that the UN could actually do a lot more. I found the UN is part of, I'm sorry to say, the people diluting some of these issues, trying to bring the impossible because of what people are saying. Let me leave it there. And finally, the legislation part, arguments on legislation versus freedom of speech. These things can be dealt with because they're trying to hide that. It's so hard to legislate because of freedom of speech. Nothing is impossible. We have the data. We have the evidence. Thank you. Thank you for that. I'm going to... Uh, Advain uh, is not for a question. It is a comment based on evidence. I'm going to also, just as our panelists respond, uh, there's a question online coming from Bangladesh about the differences uh, between threat, vulnerability, and risk, right? So, so this is another aspect that as we begin to parse out these experiences, even here and, and also when we empower women, like are we catching it before it happens? Are we in preventing it, pre-budding it? 
it or are we empowering such as even in this experience we're the user and we have the power to do it but we're running a panel at the same time of uh, combating uh, harm uh, combating harm online um, so we're gonna leave it there I'm gonna leave it uh, give our panelists a chance to respond to these questions and then I'm gonna ask my uh, colleague Sandra to sum us up um, thank you. Very, very, very quickly, um, you asked a very good question about party, in, in internal party politics. And what happens is um, sometimes the, the, the abuse that women in politics get is also party related. And it can be opposing parties, but it can also be within the party. And when it is within the party, it is when the male, your male colleague feels threatened that in the next election, you probably go for his seat. So th that is how it works. And, and to curb that, it needs to be included in the legislation. And the only legislation relevant for that is the political parties legislation and the election legislation. So one of the things that I've managed so far to push and, and, and it's, it's already work in progress is to make sure that every political party has a gender desk and has a, and has a gender policy. And such things will, will enable for, for, for the issue of complaints to be treated in a different way. Um, I, 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 I would like to conclude also by stating that oftentimes these discussions happen with the exclusion of us as parliamentarians. It's important for these discussions to happen with us being there. Because at the end of the day, one, we can share credible experiences. Anybody, anybody else would speak of experiences on, based on paper. But we can share experiences based on reality. So you may come up even with interventions, but we can easily tell you that this intervention will not work because we are living it. Similarly, as, as my colleague over there said, so it's important to put us in those discussions. And as far as the African context is concerned, the African Parliamentary Network on Internet Governance is here and is willing to work with all of you, and this is one of the items top of our agenda. My concluding remark is, join me in elevating the need for the UN to prioritize online violence on women. It needs to be recognized as one of the GBVs. Thank you. It's a fantastic call to action, and uh, I, I am very happy to be working towards that. Um, I just wanted to share the quick data points on this. Um, anybody is welcome to uh, approach, please. We would love to have your data. It helps us push back against uh, this perception that um, this is not as widespread a problem as it is. Uh, Honorable Nima, correct that once you get in public light, you get attacked more. Um, what we don't know is what that does to anybody who says, should I go online? Should I be in a leadership? And how much it's silencing voices? Um, and it happens around the world. So in Chile, for 75% uh, of the messages that are delivered on Twitter to female parliamentarians are harassing or abusive. So every time they go on Twitter, they're getting pummeled with hate speech. Um, in sweet, Swedish parliamentarians, 41% of the, of the women are getting um, doctored sexualized images of themselves sent to them. Um, our, uh, another former uh, director of research at the Web Foundation, Dana Raj Tekker, um, who now works at the Center for Democracy and Technology, came out with a report two weeks ago on the prevalence of violence against uh, w women politicians and specifically black women in the United States. That they are far more targeted, unsurprisingly, um, than any other politician. Uh, so don't. Uh, keep an eye on our Web Foundation alumni, former directors of research, people who have gone on to uh, start new partnerships. Um, it's, a, it's a formidable group. And, um, you know, it's just to say that this is not unique to a certain space. This is not one person's problems or another. It is prevalent everywhere. And it's getting worse unless we um, really understand how big a problem this is, how to prioritize it, and get it in, into all of these spaces um, of internet governance. Um, thank you. I think the only thing I'd like to add is that in addition to that call, uh, we need to have an accountability framework because I can think of all the kinds of uh, conventions and treaties that the UN and our countries have signed on to, uh, all the way back to pay equity that we still don't have, and that uh, this is really an issue of life and death for quite a number of people. 
And so in addition to that call for prioritizing this issue, it needs to also have uh, an accountability framework because just like we've had a Me Too movement, there has also been a UN2 movement. So, you know, it's, um, it's important uh, from this highest body to communicate all the way down that there is zero tolerance to this kind of behavior. Well, just to also address some of the comments and questions, um, if the platforms are not directly working and giving us the data to inform some of the actions against violence on women politicians, especially some of the recommendations you have also asked them as policy and other civil society actors is you need to provide psychosocial support to the women politicians after the elections or during the election period. If you just, the data is very, very clear. The evidence is very, very clear. There's a difference between a man politician engaging online and a woman politician engaging online. We don't need to debate. We don't need to say it's about equality. It's about, um, we just want to, it's very clear that women are abused hugely and they need additional support. And therefore we've been also trying to tell uh, Meta, for instance, are you able to provide additional support beyond uh, the mechanisms that you have online? Because if a woman politician is abused and she has to report, that's revictimization. And revictimization adds on to the hurt that she's already experiencing. But I'd like to close at that because our session time is over. And we have an online moderator who's joining us to close this panel off. Please follow us uh, online and engage with our work to see what we are putting out because we are putting evidence, 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 evidence-based um, research on what women politicians are going through online. So uh, Sandra, I'd like to welcome you. Have you been able to connect her? I think I'm here. Can you okay. hear me all right? So thank you uh, to our wonderful speakers and to, um, you know, the Honourable uh, Lugangira. Um, thank you for being so honest and authentic in your voice and for sharing your experience. Um, we have been running the Not the Cost campaign uh, since 19, I'm sorry, 20, 2016. One of our um, original members of the coalition was from Tanzania. Uh, she uh, was the coordinator for the Sextortion Coalition. Uh, so we have always had strong Tanzanian voices in our, um, uh, in our fight. And we're so happy uh, that you are taking up uh, this issue. Uh, Onika, Irene and Kat uh, and Moira, my thanks to you too for bringing your expertise and um, uh, understanding uh, to this um, to this forum. Uh, I'm so sorry not to have been with you, but I was uh, in London at the um, conference uh, headed by the UK government on preventing sexual violence uh, in conflict initiative. Uh, and of course, we know that all women who stand up for peace and resilience uh, are attacked online. Um, and the online space is also used to attack them and their communities uh, when they are seen as opponents. One of the things that Moira and I are both proud and privileged to be a part of is this growing network of technology, technologically expert uh, women who are advocates and politicians and activists uh, to fight to change this issue. We are determined to help enable a safer uh, and more open and inclusive internet. That is the way to provide the space for the creativity voice and agency of women and girls to be channeled into those spaces where the answers to our global uh, challenges begin to flourish and get resolved. Misogyny and hate online is a solvable problem uh, and we invite you all to join all of us in doing so. Thank you and all the best for the rest of the IGF. And I think just to last mention that the best practices uh, forum on gender is this afternoon. So we look forward to seeing you all there to identify some real paths forward.